Um, thank you, Michael. That's, that's so generous. <laughs> Uh, I'm Susan Sellers. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Paula and Michael and AIJ for having me. Um, I'm a partner at 2x4 from New York City. Here's the view out our studio for the last 20 years. Uh, so a city is a complex organism. Architecture, infrastructure, organizations, communities, individuals. And how does graphic design play a role? Um, What's the role of environmental graphics? Even more specifically, what are signs in the city? Um, because as designers, we usually don't position ourselves, at least at two by four, as the designers of signs. We talk about brand and identity and ideas. But at the end of the day, our, our clients often do hire us to design signs. <laughs> so signs name and they identify, and more importantly, they, they do signify. And this accumulation of diverse signs, billboards, storefronts to traffic directions compete for this job of translating our urban environments, almost creating a kind of um, geologic layer over the city, in the words of Mark Wigley and Beatrice Colomina. So this might be called local flavor, quote unquote, or the voice of the city. And it's a language that we speak and understand, especially as designers. Um, but what I'm interested in is this moment of change. Um, Something changes and then this stops making sense for us. And the signs that shape our places and, um, and they form ideas, uh, they suddenly become barriers and they defy meaning or they signify something else that we don't, we don't believe or understand anymore. And signing um, is um, in kind of clarification in that effort is by definition about boundaries. But we live in a uh, time where the idea of boundaries is changing and our faith in them is questioned. Uh, so everything is changing increasingly with increasing velocity, and um, we need to keep pace, but in bricks and mortar often. Um, so how do we make signs that are clear, that create clarity, but that blur boundaries? How do we make signs in space that embrace change? How do we translate complex conditions into simple intuitive um, experiences, bring diverse voices together, represent the past and the present simultaneously? and then ultimately redraw urban spaces in ways that are aligned with our evolving aspirations and our ideals. And, and then this, this is kind of what occupies my mind. Uh, fluidity is the uh, current condition at the moment, and it's kind of the metaphor for everything. And yet we also really need coherence to bring things together. Um, so how do we respond to this really complex condition? I'm going to talk about two um, projects. Uh, they're kind of of the city, they're inspired by the city, and um, they anticipate this to some degree and respond directly to it, both in New York City. This is Lincoln Center, as you may know. It's founded in the 50s. It kind of opened to the public in its physical form in 1962. It is considered one of the most significant cultural campuses probably in the world. Um, it has a, a very um, famous master plan organized under the, um, in the Robert, uh, Robert Moses uh, era of urban renewal. And it includes many iconic buildings uh, by Philip Johnson, Eero Saarinen, Gordon Bunshaft. It's sort of the representation of um, American modernism, the kind of height of that. It's miles of white marble, brass. It's an ivory, ivory tower to culture, essentially. It's located on 63rd through 65th Streets, Street in uh, the city's west side. Uh, but and when it was designed, the city was a really different place. The neighborhood was considered blighted. And so um, it created a kind, of, um, a kind of safe space for culture. And it, it was an early urban branding project, of course, to aggregate all of these um, cultural organizations in a single location. Um, to give it visibility and, um, and definition, create a sense of um, destination. And of course, it um, houses um, some of the most prominent companies and, um, and venues, among them Metropolitan Opera, Juilliard, um, New York State Theater, New York City Ballet, um, 13 different constituents. So we actually entered into a competition in uh, 2006 with Diller, Scafidio, and Renfro. And collectively, um, we coined this phrase, break down the walls, to capture our design intent and our vision for Lincoln Center. 
Um, at this time, the campus had kind of lost its luster. Uh, the entire complex was in need of an architectural overhaul. The neighborhood had changed and kind of grown around, so while it was kind of diminishing in character to some degree, the neighborhood was incredibly vibrant um, and had changed a lot. Also, shifting notions of culture uh, made this idea of an ivory, ivory tower seem sort of irrelevant and dusty. Um, and actually, the individual institutions had sort of grown in their, um, their stature, and um, the loyalty of those institutions didn't really extend to Lincoln Center, per se, itself. Lincoln Center was a kind of a, a relatively weak entity in relationship to its 13 constituents um, that it kind of housed. And with this project, it was an enormous effort, and they really needed to um, create a sense of common purpose to get this significant job done, uh, to make decisions, but also to um, basically fundraise and um, acquire the capital to do the project. Um, initial research found that Lincoln Center had remarkable name um, recognition among tourists. But it was less meaningful, actually, to New Yorkers, which is always kind of interesting to me. I, I never quite understand that. But even on site, tourists didn't actually, they couldn't really identify Lincoln Center when they were standing in the middle of it. And in our early research, um, cult cultural uh, or, um, security guards mentioned that uh, one of the most frequently um, asked questions was, where is Lincoln Center when they were standing in the plaza? So there's kind of no there there. Um, it literally, in, the, in this kind of plan, it literally was kind of interstitial space, the space between the buildings. It was kind of nowhere. Um, so perhaps that's why Lincoln Center was absolutely riddled with graphic design. And you saw a kind of similar um, condition in Hendrick's presentation. Um, it was complete, there were so, so many overlapping layers of communication, it was basically completely inscrutable. And also there was a sense of the codes of modernism really weren't meaningful to people anymore. They, it was big, it was brutal, there was no kind of, um, you couldn't find entries to buildings. It just didn't, um, it didn't embody what contemporary notions of the city and, and culture and art should be. Um, and what that should be was um, you know, dynamic, changing, timeless, but timely and relevant, open, diverse, generous, part of the urban fabric, transparent, accessible, young, green, exciting, and legible and cohesive. And there was a sense that um, Lincoln Center wasn't that. So uh, two by four, we were brought on in this also very complex team to provide guidance around both brand and environmental graphics and to collaborate with the architectural teams to, um, to basically elevate the idea of Lincoln Center and the space of Lincoln Center in relationship to all its 13 constituents and to kind of uh, really realize it as this world-class contemporary arts venue that was commensurate um, with the caliber of its programming, with the caliber, caliber of its constituents, and also of New York City itself. So it was a substantial kind of um, New York City urban branding project. Uh, this is the mandate. Seems pretty logical for a project like this and of this scale. But there was this sense also that everything that we should do should disappear as much as possible, that you shouldn't actually see it. Kind of a challenge. <laughs> um, there wasn't a lot of, um, they were not in the mood for more signage after all they had. Uh, and they were also, um, there was also an enormous sense of the risk of it being a kind of um, theme park. So there was a lot of um, anxiety around that. So when you have this situation, what you do is you start with heritage. <laughs> what else? And um, so we took the cues from the original campus. Uh, the single most gesture for us when you see yes are walls, but it was about the kind of quality and surface of the walls. Blank, dematerialized, white, uniform, inevitable, and yes, kind of invisible in a way. So how might we really sort of reignite this, this meaning and sort of 
basically um, re reshape, take those qualities and, and change um, what they signify for people. So this was sort of our, our, our strategy. More Lincoln Center than Lincoln Center. How? So we just kind of off the bat, we decided, well, let's use universe. It's the classic modernist font. And let's not even actually use different weights. Let's, let's try to take this idea of non-color and um, no color, this light, white, and, and very, um, invisib invisibility, and exercise that in fonts. So one font, one weight, universe. We took a material audit. And also, you know, you see everything is it's white, it's light, it's glass, it's colorless, almost like sand. It's, it's about the material. It's non-color. We did research <laughs> into, and we mapped color. Where was there space in, um, in the spectrum for um, brand recognition? Of course, all these 13 constituents had individual identities and logos. There's a lot of color going on and layers. And so we thought, you know, colorless actually might be um, the color that we work with here. We use, we'll use colorless. No one owns colorless. <laughs> and um, colorless is defined by context. I mean, and so that really speaks to this idea of Lincoln Center as a place, as a place that's kind of in between. It's defined by its context, but it also stands out at the same time. Um, we use the metaphor of um, navigating by the stars, points of light, absolutely natural, inevitable, completely intuitive, this kind of constellation of network um, that, and you guide kind of seamlessly between those things. So ultimately, we coined this visual strategy as white light transparent. And that sort of guided um, everything that we did. And, um, and it was really kind of the core idea of this visual system. So this is just a really simple diagram from our early studies and sort of communication to our clients. And so we had um, this white light was kind of the in-between, the kind of, that held all these really diverse, colorful, kind of eclectic things together. It was the kind of interface between all the communication for these individual constituents and um, the, just the, the mad eclecticism of, um, of that space, of the urban space. So building identification, donor recognition, timely kind of um, streamed content, public services, city circulation, city um, circ transportation, all became um, kind of linked by this white light transparent concept. Um, so here is the kind of completed campus, and I want to talk a little bit about the ways that this plays out. Um, in this environment, um, kind of uh, taking a kind of bird's eye view, looking to site and architecture, this break through the walls um, concept was really executed through light in the buildings. The idea was to really activate or to kind of make a stage of the buildings and what happens inside them, um, inside them, and to make that visible through this white light transparent concept. Um, L'Observatoire was um, our lighting partner on this project, which is important to note here. But um, using, we, we wanted to kind of create much more of a procession from the street and a kind of clarity and in moving into the space, which is this kind of grand stair um, that was a part of the architectural project. And not only did we want to create the sense of procession and entrance and threshold, but we wanted to sort of um, really foreground these 13 constituents, and we wanted to sort of pull the content from in, inside these spaces in, into the, um, the stair to announce the, to greet people, one, but two, to announce what was going on in Lincoln Center and let people know. So this idea of kind of turning the buildings inside out and um, expressing the content um, happening inside was a really important um, idea to this project. We were also wanted to just simply name this interstitial space, this non-place. And so we incorporated this, this very kind of simple, kind of sculptural, super, super graphic um, at the top of the stairs. 
and through light and through kind of opportune reflection um, and, and simple kind of pattern in, in white light transparent materials, we um, created these kinds of um, natural pathways that sort of linked um, city circulation to Lincoln Center and created this kind of fluid connected path. The perimeters, um, we were very interested in kind of creating a perforation between the boundaries of um, the architecture and the street. And so we lined the streets with um, these dynamic signboards that streamed live content, again, pulling the content from inside the buildings to outside to the city street, and then also streaming um, programming information and, and timely information as well. And then, um, all the typography and naming that guided you through the space very kind of quietly and, and intuitively um, occupied the surfaces of the buildings. And a big part of this project, as I said, was really stripping a lot of these modernist walls away and creating kind of visibility um, in the spaces so that you could see you could see the dancing, you could see performance, you could see people um, working, learning. And also, you can occupy these spaces on a daily basis. So um, in terms of public amenities, there were things like lounges and coffee shops and things like that included. Um, in each space, there's these bright white marquee, um, marquees that become almost, a fr again, a frame for the people that are um, using them and, and all the visitors that come by and also stream dynamic content, um, what's going on. And so again, there's this kind of theater of um, not just what's happening inside Lincoln Center, but the people that come and, and visit the space. And Lincoln Center is always an amazing place to watch people. And uh, every threshold, um, we sort of accentuated one architecturally by sort of pulling and extending it into the space, but also creating paths of light inside. And again, um, sort of framing these apertures with um, our light, white, bright um, typography and also streamed content of everything going inside, on inside individual institutions. Mapping's always really important to a project like this, and so the map was super, super simple. Again, just as clear white as, as possible. And in this place, um, something I don't talk too much about, but which was a really important part of this program, really making all these public spaces um, almost kind of exterior outdoor rooms and really um, uh, filling them with uh, trees and with, with natural... Um, green spaces. And then, of course, there's the graffiti of um, what we like to call philanthropic graffiti. Um, <laughs> donor signage, as you know, <laughs> if anyone's worked in cultural organizations, is one of the biggest challenges in terms of creating kind of clarity and um, moving through spaces. And it really, it becomes a kind of a really significant kind of obstacle. <laughs> to um, many things. And so we did our best to make it really streamlined and, um, and quiet and material, and sometimes playful responding to the space. But I think, um, you know, as I said, it's like signing is never just about physical signs. It's also about this kind of meaning behind it or, or a prompt. And so for us, that prompt was that break through the walls prompt that as designers, actually, we, we shape. And that's such an important tool, as important as the physical forms we make. And it was also the tool that in this very complex group of designers, um, design teams, it was the common um, kind of goal, the thread, the kind of action item that led our process and our, all of our individual contributions to this. And so Interestingly, what we found is that it became as important um, sign as all the wayfinding and navigation and identification in this program because it became um, a kind of strategy for Lincoln Center to rethink itself. It was a kind of scalable metaphor um, that helped it reshape its, um, its relationship to the city, that helped it reshape its relationship to its own internal partners, its constituents. Um, the overall design made the space legible and accessible, and it helped illuminate and optimize everything in the complex. But this break through the walls also was kind of a creative mantra that encouraged innovation and collaboration. And of course, in, in creating this space and this whole initiative, it was very much about um, 
creating a kind of role or a part for Lincoln Center in this whole process. And so a kind of marker of the success of, of this whole program from the beginning to end was um, these kind of creative collaborations or you would call co-branding um, uh, opportunities um, that then sort of uh, basically were very, um, were almost immediately took place. So in 2011, this project was finished and um, this space was used for um, Fashion Week. And um, actually, I think it just, mo it just <laughs> moved now. Um, but also, actually, um, at this point, Lincoln Center um, initiated um, what they called the White Light Festival, where they actually instigated collaborative projects among the different constituents that actually took place in the public spaces and in these kinds of um, lobby spaces out through the space. So, our work as designers is, is it's physical, but it's also this conceptual space that really helps to transform and change organizations. And this was really kind of a marker um, of this success, um, this kind of collective sex, um, success. So the, this project is a um, very big kind of project, and a lot of these urban projects are so intense. So I wanted to just take a few extra minutes <laughs> to show a different project, a very quick fleet project that talks about um, transgressing boundaries, um, crowdsourcing ideas, elevating them in the city. Um, and this is an urban pro um, branding project we did for, um, for New York um, uh, NYC and Co. called Multifesto. Um, it was f basically kicked off and launched um, uh, what is now NYC by Design, a kind of design week that was um, designed to basically compete with London Design Festival and Tokyo. And it was this very simple kind of interactive project. It was an interface that basically asked that you share um, a three-word three manifesto for the city. And the result of that, um, it basically sampled all of these different um, designers through the city who, that cross disciplines, that um, worked in different design fields, and sort of elevated them to the kind of to the city. I, I wanted to, to end with something that wasn't just so massive. This was a project that was done in about three weeks. Um, a colleague worked in NYC uh, um, at NYC and Co. And they said, "Hey, do something." There's Paula, and. Um, we thought, what, where should we do this space? And we thought, we really want to do something in Times Square and really just puncture that kind of very um, uh, complex space and elevate designers' voices and uh, talk about what's possible and, and um, what kind of change we'd like to see in the city through this kind of dynamic media. So this has... Does have sound, but here with that idea of design, um, environmental design as this kind of urban prompt. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Susan, thank you so much. Um, Paula, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> knowing Lincoln Center so well, because I work for a number of the constituents up there, they are an unruly group of, of not very Children. giving, babyish, impossible. <laughs> How the hell did you get them to fall in line? That's you know, it's so crazy. I have to say that that project looks pretty simple, right? Pretty easy. Um, well, <laughs> it's such a pleasure to represent it as that now. <laughs> And a lot of time's gone by, so I feel a lot better about it. Can but, you tell the audience how long that project took? Yeah, that, that project, I think the really, really intense development was a six-year project. I would say it really was more to eight to 10 years, and it still continues on in our studio. So these projects are incredible, incredible time investment. And um, it's something that really, actually really fascinates me, because for me, I am really interested in this idea of 
how you take this idea that's generative and how you capture that in a design language and then how that, as I said, it, it like plays out in all these different ways. And it's this subtle thing that gets into your head, into your client's head, and hopefully they take that and they go forward. But it's, it's, it was nearly impossible. I mean, it really, we had many generations of amazing designers leave our studio because of that project. They now all work at Pentagram. They are partners at Pentagram. I'm highly resentful. But, um, but I'm all about sharing. <laughs> no, no, I, I, it, what Susan's saying is true. I mean, Paul and I have both worked with different entities at Lincoln Center, and occasionally they'd say, well, you know, 2 by 4 is doing the master plan for the signage, and we'd meet someone, we'd meet a designer, just have a coordinating meeting. And I came to sort of expect, Every, there's you know, everyone. there was always that look on their face like they just were like, yeah. it's been going on so long, and, you know, and we just try, we just try yeah. to be very nice and appreciative. But, but what's genius is that the holding that thing together with the light is, is yeah. the brilliant sort because it's the only thing you can argue with yeah. because in fact it's not really on anything it's just light yes. and, and you're in a and you can always light, change so it it's incredible. just light so don't worry we're just going to go with it for a few days and try it out <laughs> Um, you yeah. gave us an amazing gift in this two-word phrase, philanthropic graffiti. Uh, um, I, know, I give it to you with yes, pleasure. Thing, no, Use I, it liberally. I am like... As, as it is liberal. No, no, <laughs> everywhere. I, am, I am very close to sort of never doing another signage project for a cultural institution. Again, just because it starts out with great hopes and dreams and you have all these ideas and they say, well... We have a meeting with a donor next week on Wednesday, and can you just really quickly um, just mock up what their name might look like over the door? And you, and you say, well, we haven't even picked a typeface, we haven't done a strategy. Oh, no, Don't worry, they, they, they'll no, tell you what that is. It's just a placeholder. Place. <laughs> they the know point, what they want. I'm at the point, like, what if I just send a book of typefaces and a tape measure over, and you just <laughs> pick whatever you yeah. want? And, yeah. Well, I have to say that to the chase, I, ha I have a particular passionate hatred. <laughs> I'm a hater of donor recognition on issue two. And then, you know, some of you might know that I actually spent um, three years at the Met doing kind of rebranding and, and kind of design it within that at institution. At the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Yeah, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which of course is absolutely the same condition. In a way, the same exact project as Lincoln Center, I realize. So I don't really know what that's about, but I am back at two by four now, so I'm, I'm feeling good. Recovering. <laughs> yes, exactly, okay. I'm recovering. Uh, time for a question from the audience? Yes. Yeah, um, the question was knowing how difficult the client was to begin with and using light, electricity, digital media to that extent, were they afraid about the budget? It's like expensive, right? Um, that's a really good question. I have to say that that was not something that I remember being kind of high on their list of anxieties. There were city issues with that, though. Because yeah. there were city issues with that. Because I was on the design commission during that period, and like the, the, the whole thing with the, the yeah. steps was a really big deal. And it had to be tested, and it had to be a specific kind of light, and it couldn't glare, and it couldn't block in traffic. General, and sort of yeah. that. In general, yeah. light, light is very um, controversial in New York City streets, and there is a lot of different um, government and neighborhood, there local are constituencies. So people in apartment buildings across the street were, were, would be very yeah. vocal about that. And yes, there, there were exactly. The, about the neighbors, as they're often things called. That move. Uh, you know, I, I, they, that they have, uh, if you have to sometimes go down to City Hall and like break an ordinance because they'll say a sign type can't move or change and they'll, they'll determine how fast it can move or change and that's part of it is written into code. So there's a yeah. lot of that that you go through. Yeah. Um, one more question? Yeah, way back there. Um, uh, what do you mean? How, um, how like, if, if it wasn't associated with an architectural renovation, what would have happened? Yeah. If you just were doing remedial signage on yeah. the existing Well, we might not take the project, but, um, but uh, you know, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think it, it can be done, and it probably would have been done in a very different, I mean, uh, uh, it's a very holistic project in general, but can it be done and could this strategy be used without the architectural? Yes, it would be more challenging. It wouldn't be as integrated or as elegant and that was really important to Lincoln Center. Uh, one more, yes. Uh, hi Susan, um, I know that, what I would love for you to speak a little bit of the 
relationship of a designer with the architect. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, I was your competition of this project. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> I was with Tom Bain. And, mm -hmm. and so for me, it's like that relationship that we have to, with the architects is beautiful. And I just would mm -hmm. love for you to speak a little bit on that. Um, Rebecca Mendez reveals, uh, perhaps for the first time publicly, that she was the competing <laughs> team. Uh, I didn't know. Maybe yeah. you should have gotten it. It was, it was hard. It was yeah. very bad. It was hard. You're, you were the real winner, Rebecca, as it turns out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, she was paired with the architect, uh, the brilliant architect Tom Main. Uh, uh, Susan was with uh, Dillard Scafilio Renfro. What was that relationship like, and how important was it to defining the nature of the work you ended up well, doing? Well, it's really interesting. I mean, I have to say that we have a very, um, that really defines a lot of the development of our studio. I mean, we grew up, actually, our studio really grew up with certain architecture firms, with Office for Metropolitan Architecture, with DSR. And so we really um, have a very fluid process with those architects. And um, you know, we trade off ideas, but actually, especially with DSR, I mean, this idea of capturing a design um, intent in language, I mean, I, I repeat that over and over because it's so critical to our process. And um, you know, we really, we think, we work, we sketch a lot together, and to get, we often are the people that come up with that language, and um, it's, I mean, it's fun because then you have this kind of really generative tool and you work in your respective areas and sometimes you cross over into um, you know, other people's disciplines. And um, you know, I, th I think there are times where there's maybe a hierarchy sometimes of the architect to the graphic designer and a kind of power struggle. Um, and I, I have to say that I've kind of experienced that more in earlier in my career. And one, we, we know these firms so well, but I think maybe it is also about sort of just like aging into your field and you're not as uptight about it or something, yeah. you know? But it, I think, it, I mean, I really enjoy it, even though these are hard projects. I do really like to work in these very dynamic teams and, you know, creative collaborators now that I've worked with for, you know, two decades. It's fun. Susan, thank you. Thank you.